Hi everyone and welcome to the Emergency Physicians ECG course. This is Hisham Ibrahim, I'm one of the Emergency Medicine Consultants in the United Kingdom and today we're going to be discussing case number 47 from our Facebook page. Before we start, just a quick two things to mention. So first of all, thank you so much for those of you who attended uh, the ARCHEM conference, uh, CPD conference, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the interaction on the presentation was really great and I really appreciate all your feedback. And a big thanks to the organizing committee of the conference. It was fantastically organized and really well done. The second quick thing is, uh, so um, on the 28th of May, it will be our first virtual EPIC course. So uh, I will put the link to how to join the course in the um, show notes of this video. And uh, yeah, it will be re really great to see all of you. You can do it virtually now. Okay, without any further delays, let's move on to our case for today. So the case we're going to talk about is going to be about a 76 year old male patient who presented to ED feeling really unwell, looked unwell with bradycardia and hypotension. His past medical history showed AF. He was on rivaroxaban for this with beta blockers and digoxin. He was also known to be hypertensive on ramipril and his vital signs in ED showed heart rate of 27, so really bradycardic. Uh, blood pressure of 80 over 45, so in a uh, in hypotension as well. And uh, he looked unwell. He looked like uh, he was really shocked just looking at him from the end of the bed. So this was his ECG on arrival to ED. And um, I'd like you to pause here, have a detailed look at this ECG before we move on. Okay, let's move on. And this was his blood gas on arrival to ED, so that's a venous blood gas. And again, another pause here, have a proper look at this blood gas, try to interpret the whole story, and uh, let's see what you think in terms of what is going on here. So, let's start by analyzing the ECG first. Looking at this ECG, so to be honest, if we look at that, it is really bradycardic and the, the rate was about 20, uh, 25. Uh, the complexes are broad. Uh, the rhythm is irregular. It might look regular to you looking from a distance because it's really slow, but actually if you map it out, it is an irregular rhythm. So what we're, there are no clear P waves that I can see. So probably we're talking about a slow AF here in a patient who is known AF. The other thing that uh, worth mentioning here is that if you have a detailed look at this ECG, you might notice that actually the T waves are a little bit pointy. So again, another concerning feature that matches the findings that we, uh, we've seen in the blood gas. So in summary, I think what we're dealing with here is a slow AF, pointy T waves probably related to hyperkalemia. Now we're going to move on to the venous blood gas. So looking at this blood gas, there will be plenty of abnormalities here that will uh, really make me concerned. So let's start with the pH. We've got a metabolic acidosis here. Uh, so our pH is on the acidosis side with a PCO2 and a venous gas that is normal. So probably in the arterial one is going to be low. We've got low bicarb and a really low base excess of minus 15. So, um, so that is a metabolic acidosis with probably a respiratory compensation. We've got a really high lactate, so lactate of 13. That is a scary number to see. We've got a high blood sugar. So these numbers are in millimol per liter. So that, these are uh, the UK references. Uh, so we've got a really high blood sugar here. The potassium is high as well. So the potassium is 6.25. So that is counted as moderate hyperkalemia. We've also got some other electrolyte disturbance. So the sodium is in the low side and the calcium is a little bit on the low side and the chloride is slightly low. And finally, we've got a bit of anemia here. So the hemoglobin is 89. So if we want to summarize what we've got findings wise so far, we've got bradycardia in the form of a slow AF. We've got renal failure shown as hyperkalemia metabolic acidosis, so likely renal failure. We've got an AV blocking drugs on board, beta blockers and digoxin. 
we've got a shocked patient uh, with a systolic of 80 and really high lactate. And we've got hyperkalemia with a potassium that is uh, 6.4. So if we combine all these findings together, then that will give us the diagnosis of this case, which is Brash syndrome. So let's talk about this condition now. So Brash syndrome is defined as a combination of the following. So bradycardia, renal failure, AV nodal blockers, shock, and hyperkalemia. When you have all these findings together, this is what is going to define our syndrome today. The pathogenesis is quite interesting. So uh, basically, the most common population here are the elderly population. I'll explain why. And the story is usually um, starts with, um, with a, a bit of a dehydration or the use of a drug that will increase the potassium. In a patient who's got borderline renal failure and then the renal failure will happen because of the trigger and renal failure will result in hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia can cause bradycardia and in addition to AV blocking drug on board that will make the bradycardia really severe and the bradycardia will decrease the cardiac output which will decrease the renal perfusion which will make the renal failure worse and that will trigger this vicious cycle that will keep going and the patient will be really unwell. So this is how Brash syndrome happens. As we said, the precipitation for this is usually one of two things, the common ones, either hypovolemia or dehydration, secondary most probably to gastroenteritis or decreased fluid intake in elderly, or a medicine that promotes hyperkalemia or renal injury. Any of these two can trigger the vicious cycle of the uh, Brush syndrome. And uh, this, is, uh, this is another diagram to just to explain the difference between Brush syndrome and pure hyperkalemia and uh, pure AV blocking, um, AV nodal blocking drugs. So it is where the overlap happens when you have the two. So hyperkalemia can cause a bit of bradycardia. AV nodal blockers will cause a bit of bradycardia, but, but when you have the two together, this will result in the vicious cycle. So how to differentiate Brush syndrome from pure hyperkalemia? Well, with hyperkalemia, the degree of hyperkalemia in pure hyperkalemia versus Brush syndrome is a bit different. So with Brush syndrome, you will have just mild or moderate hyperkalemia with severe bradycardia. This is because it is not just the potassium that is causing the bradycardia. There is a synergistic effect of having AV blockers, um, AV nodal blockers on board as well. Second thing is the ECG changes of hyperkalemia are disproportionate to the potassium level. So the bradycardia without other features of hyperkalemia favors Brush syndrome. So with hyperkalemia to cause really severe bradycardia, I would expect the potassium to be too high. And with a too high potassium, I would expect many findings in the ECG. But with Brush syndrome, you get the significant bradycardia without many ECG features of hyperkalemia in the ECG. So moving on to differentiate it from the AV, uh, pure AV blockers um, intoxication or overdose. So presence of hyperkalemia. So usually with, uh, with pure beta blockers or calcium child blockers overdose, the potassium is usually okay but it is an essential component to have hyperkalemia in Brush syndrome. And the second thing is the history. So patients with significant AV blocker intoxication usually have a history of an overdose. But with Brush syndrome, they are patients who are taking the normal medicine with the normal dose. It is just a decreased excretion of it because of the renal failure that caused the problem. So talking about the treatment of the condition, it is usually just to treat the hyperkalemia and be aggressive with that and be quick with this. So give calcium, give dextrose insulin, give salbutamol or beta-2 agonist. And the salbutamol in particular or beta-2 agonist in particular are gonna be useful here because of the tachycardic effect of them that will help with the bradycardia that the patient is coming with. Give IV fluids if the patient is uh, hypovolemic or dehydrated. 
and treat the bradycardia and the shock and that's another cornerstone uh, part of the treatment so uh, usually you give adrenaline or you might give non-selective beta agonist um, like isoprenaline but it is important to correct the bradycardia and the shock to break the circuit so this is um, this is a nice algorithm that was produced by the Renal Association UK and it is just been published uh, updated I mean recently in uh, 2020 and um, and it talks you through um, basically what to do uh, with hyperkalemia and as we can see here so for a moderate hyperkalemia which is from 6 to 6.4 um, so without ECG changes you give glucose insulin you give solvitamol and um, with the severe hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, so above 6.5, so you give calcium chloride or gluconate and the other lines of treatment. And it covers the doses as well of the various agents that you need to give. So it's a really useful tool that I'm going to attach in the show notes of this video for you to go through. So be careful about a few things when it comes to brush syndrome. So... Uh, there are some lines of treatment that are not really recommended with Bryce syndrome. So if you treat the beta blockers or calcium channel blockers toxicity purely, that is probably not recommended. So if you use something like glucagon, for example, for beta blocker toxicity, it's not going to be helpful and it might be harmful because of the side effects of glucagon uh, because it can induce severe vomiting. Pacing as well is not really recommended here, not because it's not going to work, it's mainly because it's not really needed. It is a pure metabolic problem. Once you fix the problem, the heart rate will improve. Uh, but pacing is probably not going to be that indicated here. And lastly, if you follow the ALS bradycardia algorithm, probably you are going to get it wrong. Because if you follow the algorithm, it's, it recommends giving atropine, which doesn't work here, and it recommends pacing, which is probably not needed here. So this is the Rhesus Cancer UK bradycardia algorithm. And again, if you follow the algorithm, our patient will be unstable because our patient has had shock. And then it says give atropine and then keep going with atropine up to three milligrams before you start thinking about something else, uh, which can be pacing. And again, not really needed, not really needed. So unless you go down to here straight away, then that will be a little bit um, inappropriate. And the other thing is you don't really need the glucagon here because it is not going to be the best option. So straight to isoprenaline or to adrenaline for treatment of this bradycardia and shock. So let's move back to our case and let's see what happens. So our case was a 76 year old male patient who presented to ED unwell bradycardic hypotensive with a background of AF on AV blocking drugs and um, hypertension on Ramipril and the case progressed as uh, you will see. So treatment given to the patient was, so first of all we've done digoxin level because that's the patient who's in digoxin coming with acute renal failure so you have to worry about digoxin toxicity and the levels were fine. We've done blood ketones because the patient came in with metabolic acidosis and high blood sugar. And again, you have to worry about DKA. Again, all normal. So calcium IV was given. Insulin infusion, it was just insulin, not glucose insulin because the blood sugar was already high. And isoprenaline infusion was given to, con to, to correct the bradycardia. And lastly, some IV fluids were given. And let's see the response to this. So this is the blood gas that we started with. So if we uh, go through this blood gas, so we can, uh, as we said before, we've got a uh, metabolic acidosis here that is uh, compensated with some uh, wash of the CO2. So um, we've given some treatment for the hyperkalemia here. And let's see the response to this. So here we go. So the first one was a VBG, so that is a venous blood gas. Second one is an ABG, so that's an arterial blood gas. We can see the difference between the PO2 here, which was 2, and the PO2 here, which is 30. So the PO2 in the ABG is quite high. I would probably decrease the oxygen that this patient is receiving. But pH, a bit better, so it's 7.25 now. The PCO2 is low, so that is the respiratory compensation for the metabolic acidosis. 
the bicarb is a bit less, base excess is slightly worse, uh, but the potassium is better significantly, so it's 5.3 now. The sugar is better, the lactate is better. Moving on to the third ABG, and uh, now the oxygen is fine, so it looks like they've uh, decreased the oxygenation of this patient. pH is much better, it's back to normal now. PCO2 is still low, but the bicarb started building up now. We've got a bicarb of 16 instead of 11, and the base excess started going down, which is good. So, and the potassium is now almost normal, it is 5.07, and the lactate is better. And the last ABG is showing a pH that is almost a bit alkalotic actually, um, with a bicarb that is much better, base excess much better, and uh, the potassium is now normal, and the lactate now is four. It's one of the rare situations when you say, oh, my patient's lactate is four, that is great. So, um, so that was the progression of the case. The patient was clinically much better, and uh, he was admitted to CCU. Uh, before going to CCU, let's have a quick look at the ECGs of the patient and see uh, the response to isoprenaline. So, with isoprenaline infusion, initially the heart rate increased significantly because it was a combination of the treatment of the hyperkalemia and the isoprenaline infusion. Uh, but with a bit uh, more control with the isoprenaline infusion, this was the ECG. So, now we've got a very reasonable rate. The blood pressure is much better. Looking at the ECG now, um, actually the pointy T waves are still the same. I'm not 100% sure what was the exact potassium level when this particular ECG was done. Um, I'm not really sure if I can see some atrial activities here or these are just uh, fibrillation waves or flutter waves, but I tried to map them out and I couldn't really map things out. So not really sure about this one. But the patient was much better, heart rate improved, everything started going in the right direction with a uh, few hours of treatment in uh, ED rhesus. And uh, yeah, here we go, admitted to CCU. So um, this was the case about Brash syndrome. So in summary, Brash syndrome occurs when a patient uh, who's already taking AV nodal blockers develop renal failure uh, and hyperkalemia and it leads to a vicious circuit of worsening hyperkalemia, renal failure, bradycardia, and shock. So be aware about um, these things when you're dealing with this condition. So if you follow the ALS algorithm, probably it won't help you. Uh, it will advise you to give atropine, it will advise you to pace, and actually it doesn't have anything about calcium, which is a cornerstone treatment in this case. Um, and it will advise you to give glucagon, which is not really recommended in this case. So uh, this was it about our case. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm gonna put in the show notes some links to further readings regarding the case. And I'll put the link to the next EPIC course if you wanna have a look at that. And uh, finally uh, is our question regarding where do you think this picture is taken from? Thank you very much for all your interaction and I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now and stay safe.